Okay, well, hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining our webinar. Um, the title of today's webinar is Recognizing Unsafe Care, What It Is and How to Report It. Next slide, please. Um, so before I jump into the objectives, I will very quickly introduce myself. So my name is Sarah Miller. I'm our Director of Partnerships here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, and we're very excited again to welcome you to this month's webinar. And in a few slides, we will introduce our panelists, but I will start off by jumping into the objectives. So the first objective for today is defining the term medical error and discuss the most frequent types of um, patient harm. The second is understanding the difference between negligence and human error. The third, describing the typical process for reporting unsafe care. The fourth is discussing how to escalate concerns that are not adequately addressed even after they have been reported. And then finally, the last one is examining ways that patients and families can get involved in dri driving organizational improvement. Next slide, please. So just a quick housekeeping item for those of you that are on the live webinar today, we will be providing um, one approved CE credit for VCPA. Um, it will take about five to seven days to process. So if you have any questions at all, please feel free to email clinical at patientsafetymovement.org with any questions regarding your CE. So with that said, we will jump into introducing our panelists. So um, I will be facilitating today's webinar, but it's my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Marcy Romero. So Marcy, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you so much, Sarah. It is a pleasure to be here today with all of you, and especially with this esteemed panel. My name is Marcy Romero. I'm a registered nurse. I am a nurse at the University of New Mexico Hospital in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I am the manager for the Patient Family Advisory Committee. I've been in this role for about a year, and I am passionate about including the patient voice in the delivery of healthcare. The patient perspective is so important to everything that we do, and in fact, we cannot move forward without it. So with that, I am going to introduce our panelists. Peter, I am going to begin with yourself. Peter Capitain, and Peter, I'm sorry if I said your last name wrong, comes to us from the Netherlands and as a patient advocate, as well as a CEO at Inspire to Live, an organization with an international reach that connects patients, researchers, and clinicians in the fight against cancer. Peter is currently program manager and advisor for complex and politically difficult problems where he organizes, congresses, and lobbies the matrix of public authorities. That's difficult work, Peter healthcare organizations, insurance companies, and health research institutes. Peter's sole aspiration, I love this, is to create awareness and hope through showing people to live their lives happy and healthy in harmony with cancer. Peter, thank you for all that you do. And Carol, Carol, you have an impressive bio. Carol graduated from Colorado State University, go Rams, with a degree in speech communication. She received a master's degree in patient safety leadership from the University of Illinois at Chicago and a second master's degree in healthcare ethics from Creighton University. Carol has worked in healthcare for 30 years. She was an adjunct professor at the University of Illinois Chicago for 10 years, teaching in their master's program for patient safety. Currently, Carol is the Senior Director of Education for MedStar Institute for Quality and Safety, and she is also the Director of Education um, at the Executive Master's Program for Clinical Quality Safety Leadership at Georgetown University. Emil Garn is involved in patient safety work across the country. She sits on the LeapFrog Patient and Family Caregiver Expert Panel, Board of Quality Safety and Experience at Children's Hospital Colorado, Pediatric Sepsis Outcomes Collaborative at Children's Hospital Colorado, Clinical Excellence Council for Colorado Hospital Association, and the Board of Directors for the Collaborative for Accountability and Improvement. That is a mouthful, Carol. Her passion resides in transparency and communication after medical errors, healthcare communication, and the power of storytelling. The, after, the aftermath endured by providers, patients, and families when medical harm transpires. And last but not least, I introduce Robin Betts, who is an RN like myself and a leader in clinical innovation and the implementation of safety improvement. She has dedicated her professional life to patient safety, quality, and high reliability systems to elevate patient safety and quality in healthcare. She has a distinguished 38-year healthcare career as a pediatric and NICU nurse, nursing informaticist, and executive leader 
of quality risk management and patient safety. As Vice President for Quality, Clinical Effectiveness, and Regulatory Services for Kaiser Permanente Northern California, Robin helps further advance Kaiser Permanente's nation-leading excellence in quality and patient safety, mental health services, and oversees health plans and hospital regulatory functions, including compliance, licensing, and member grievances. She sets the vision for patient safety and quality in pursuit of clinical quality excellence. So with that, let's begin. I'd like to begin by asking our audience to go ahead and use the chat box and define the term medical error for me, please. And while you're doing that, again, use the chat box to find the term medical error. I'm gonna give you a definition from the Institute of Medicine, of Medicine and as well to our uh, panel. So Institute of Medicine defines medical error as the failure of a planned action to be completed as intended or the use of a wrong plan to achieve an aim. There are two types of errors, right? We have errors of omission and errors of commission. Errors of omission occur as a result of an action not taken. Um, for example, not leaving the bedrolls up for a patient that is at risk for falling, or let's say not using the proper safety protocols when transferring a patient using a trans transfer device, uh, maybe a lift. Errors of commission occur as the result of the wrong action taken. So an example would be providing um, medication to a patient where it was documented that the patient had an allergy to that medication or operating on the wrong body part. I think it's important with that being said that we note that not all medical errors result in harm, right? And likewise, when harm does occur, it's not always the result of a medical error. Often the medical error is a preventable adverse event and they can occur in a number of settings. So Peter, from your perspective, I'm curious as a patient advocate, do you believe the majority of patients have a clear understanding of the definition of medical error? Well, the answer is, uh, um, it depends, uh, of course. Uh, always be, be aware that I, uh, I, I, I look at uh, the world from the cancer patient's perspective. So coming to, uh, to the, the moment that you have your diagnosed, I think most patients do not have an understanding of medical errors, which is quite logical because the day before you were not a patient yet. Um, looking at the two, uh, the two definitions, omission and commission, uh, I think even cancer patients who are shortly ago diagnosed have a feeling what a wrong action taken might be uh, because they feel it quite uh, in quite short term. Um, they definitely do not know omission uh, errors, um, which is quite uh, quite normal in cancer patients' life that they uh, have uh, a, a, that the result of actions not taken because quite a lot of uh, treatments are not available for patients uh, within a country uh, or external of the country. So the, 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 it's, well, it depends. Most patients when they are only in a short, uh, only short term, a, a patient do not know anything but become aware of the situation uh, and cancer patients live. Uh, and that's, of course, a, 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 a good thing, uh, longer and longer and longer. And then they become aware of what is possible, what is not possible, what is an error and what is not an error, which is a failure, which is not a failure. Uh, Peter, do you think in order to make uh, an impact globally that, that patients should be more uh, well-equipped with knowledge? So have that knowledge beforehand, uh, do you think that would help aid in the reduction of medical errors? Uh, oh, oh, definitely, yeah, but, but, but again, when you become a patient on day one, you do not know anything, so you need help. And for that, I mean, I always make a difference. It's kind of my definition between a patient and a patient advocate. The patient is, well, does not know any uh, anything from the start. Patient advocates should know they uh, and they should uh, uh, assist patients in the way they should walk uh, in, in in well preventing them from uh, uh, having not the right treatment uh, and 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 
make them aware that there are medical errors that should be prevented that if they happen they can assist in well do the things that are necessary to prevent them in the future in the future absolutely you know it makes me think of um, what you said uh like for example if i were to go to a car mechanic i don't know a whole lot about cars and i certainly wouldn't know what to ask for in diagnostic terms right and so but the, certainly once your car breaks down and you have to uh, let's say replace a transmission, you might do a little bit of education. And if I could remind everyone to please um, go on mute, that would be helpful. Thank you. All right. And so I recently, um, as you know, I, I'm the uh, manager for PFAC. And I recently had an advisor uh, have the privilege of presenting with our residents of the Department of Internal Medicine. And one thing that she brought up was the mental and emotional impact that sometimes medical errors have on patients that really providers don't think about. Um, Carol, 87.3% of patients in a recent Patient Safety Movement Foundation poll reported that they knew nothing or had heard nothing about medical errors within their local community within the last year. How important is it for clinicians and patients to speak a common language in an effort to reduce medical errors? So Marcy, it's really um, important because as we know in healthcare, healthcare has its own language, big words, acronyms, and there's a real push out there um, with organizations, not just across the healthcare, but across other industries, and it's called plain language. So in other words, in healthcare, um, we tend to use words like expire. When What does that mean to different cultures, to different people? Someone died. Um, the other thing is, is in using plain language, then patients and families can understand more about what is going on in their care. And then they can speak and articulate back to the providers so that it's a bi-directional communication. So it's really important that, um, you know, we're, we're talking and communicating where everyone is on what they say, the same sheet of music. <clears throat> exactly, we're singing from the same hymnal. And, and what you said about, you know, bi-directional, I agree, and it makes me think of teach back and how important that relationship is between the provider and the patient. And, and I'll be honest, as an RN uh, providing patient care, there have been times when I have thought that I explained something very clearly, uh, when in fact, I had not. So um, Carol, you know, I, I, I completely agree with what you said. And with that being said, I will change the focus to patient education. 2019 report published by the Betsy Lehman Center for Patient Safety estimates the annual cost of medical errors in the state of Massachusetts alone, I thought this was fascinating, to be $617 million in the state of Massachusetts alone. Again, this number does not reflect the emotional and mental impact that's placed on patients and providers. So Robin, I'd love to hear from you. From your perspective, what's the biggest barrier to providing comprehensive, person-centered education on quality improvement so that patients can understand this whole process or at least the tip of the iceberg? Yeah, I think that's such a great question. Healthcare has a long standing history of designing for the patient instead of with the patient. And so, in general, we are more comfortable directing care instead of partnering in that care. Um, despite the concept of patient and family centered care emerging two decades ago when the Institute of Medicine published Crossing the Quality Chasm. So we have a sense that we would be more mature. However, there is a lot of great maturity. Patient and family advisory councils have been formed, but they largely remain existential to the safety and quality organization structures where we kind of reach into them when we want their input instead of embedding them and having them be representative on our quality and safety committees to both hold us accountable for quality and safety and to provide insights into solutioning for safety. So there is a maturity and many organizations are somewhere along the spectrum, but we still have a long way to go. Um, you know, and I, I, I agree, I think it's exciting to see organizations not only um, form PFACs, which we know have been around since the 1970s, but also to inform 
key facts with QS, so patient family advisory, quality, and safety councils, and, and including patients in uh, the beginning of a process rather than creating a process and then going to them and saying, hey, what do you think of this? Um, in fact, it saves a lot of time when you include them at the beginning because they will notice things um, and they will have input, which as a healthcare professional, we want that. Um, I think about transparency and it can be scary, right? Especially when we're being transparent about flaws or um, something that we're normally not transparent about. What you just shared you know, about the collaboration, I think is spot on. So Peter, again, um, and I know everyone on this panel has a lot of experience, so please feel free to chime in. But Peter, I can tell that you're extremely passionate about improving health outcomes for patients and families. And I wanna play the devil's advocate for a second. I've been told by patients at times and that um, they wanna put all of their trust in the doctor, right? So why, why should I be involved? The doctor is the expert. You know, I, I, he, this person, he or she has all the education. They're the ones that went to school. I'm just going to trust the doctor. What's wrong with that scenario? Well, if you have a broken leg, I think you should rely on the expert uh, to, to, to <laughs> repair that broken leg. But in many diseases, there are choices to be made. Um, uh, and it's not always the right thing to treat um, uh, until the end. Uh, sometimes patients do not want to be treated at all. They choose for a good quality of life for the rest of that life. That might be three months, six months, a year, two years. So that means that, yes, the doctor might be the expert on that disease, but the choice is a personal perspective. Uh, and then the quality of life is determined by the patient. So the ins, the outs, the pros, the cons of different uh, scenarios in treatments uh, 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 should be decided by the patient based on good information. And yes, the, 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 the professional can give that information. The patient herself can also find a lot of information about that. Um, and in the end, um, uh, in a good dis discussion, it's the decision of the patient uh, what the right treatment is. So yes, the expert is necessary, but it's not the only one who determines what the right treatment is. And Carol and Robin, do you have anything you want to add? Robin, I see your hand yes, up. I, yeah, I, uh, any high, we, there's a concept about high reliability science. So these are a highly reliable organization is an organization that uh, consistently delivers on quality. They have very, very few defects. And one of the principles of high reliability is deference to expertise. These organizations defer to the experts no matter where they reside in the hierarchy. In healthcare, that may mean a patient or family member who is a content expert regarding some of the normal baseline. And uh, they often are the first signals that our patients or, uh, or their family member is getting into trouble. And so listening to them is imperative. Absolutely, yeah, Carol. I'll add Marcy is, I think we have to also think about this from a cultural and generational. I agree. You know, my mom's 85. That generation, you listen to what the physician said. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a very technical, savvy, new, younger generation that are doing a lot of homework. They go in, they ask questions. But there's also cultural issues where certain cultures would never question someone they feel is at a higher level or higher authority. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can teach and we need to teach and we need to make people speak up. Um, but we also have to be aware of where people are in their lifespan and how they've been brought up. Um, all of those other things play a factor into why some, some patients and families do not speak up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. I am, I am glad someone brought that up. And I also saw a comment in the chat um, that stated that the patient is the expert on themselves. And, and absolutely. And I, I believe it's probably, um, it's not probably, it is the role of the healthcare provider to empower the patient, to, to empower the patient to take control of their health care, because it isn't always natural. It doesn't always come natural, especially when it's foreign, right? right. And so, um, and I think about access too, access to information. Not everyone has equal access to information. So, um, thank you. 
The one other thing I'll add, because this goes along sure. with Robin's expert deference to expertise, mm -hmm. is we can often see when our loved ones are decompensating way before a lab test because we know them, we know those behaviors, and we know ourselves. So understanding, again, to listen to the patient and family, because we might not be able to say, oh, we think they're septic, but we can see the changes and say something's wrong, something's not right. You know, mm -hmm. listen to me. I don't know the medical term. I don't know the technical term, but I know this child, and this is not their normal behavior. It's the same notion as a nurse, I think. I'm um, oh, sorry, Robin. Go for it. I'm sorry. Don't well, interrupt you. I, I just, I just love that. But what, what makes deference to expertise so important to a highly reliable organization is because they, they are able to intervene early before things exacerbate. Yeah. And so, accepting the information from the patient or family member that's giving you that early signal allows us to intervene early instead of react in a, a situation where there's a complete decompensation. So it's, it's just such a beautiful concept. I loved Carol's comments too about high distance power that can be cultural, it can be age and, and upbringing as well. And so it's such an important factor to consider as we in healthcare need to have sensitivity to that. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes those social determinants of health uh, have, a, have a definite play in this. I'd like to apply, uh, uh, rather provide some troubling statistics, um, which I'm sure many of you know. It's estimated that between 210,000 and 440,000 individuals die from medical error yearly, which makes medical error the third leading cause of death in the United States behind heart disease and cancer. Now, globally, there are an estimated 3 million people that die each year. And to put those numbers in, perspe in perspective, that is more than HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. It is the equivalent of three jumbo jet crashes every two days. Could you imagine? So Peter, in your opinion, how have we gotten to this point? And what have been major milestones that we have, and what have we learned from other industries? Well, the, to, to start with the last one, I think <clears throat> to prevent medical and uh, er, uh, uh, medical errors, we learned a lot from um, uh, from the uh, from the uh, uh, aircraft industry, and um, uh, and and a very a very big tragedy happened in 1977 when there was the biggest uh, 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 accident in in in, uh, in aircraft was was on, t on the island of Tenerife where over 500 people died, and that was kind of a, a an impulse in 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 making good controls and checklists, which were also used. Of course, not from the technical perspective, from a different technical perspective, which were also used in in healthcare. Um, and one of the biggest thing that was introduced was. Um, you could say a kind of a second opinion that if someone says this is it, someone else has to say, yes, you're right. Um, doing surgery, the surgeon has to say, this is the way you have to do it. And another one says, yes, you're right. And if of course the other one says, no, you're not, then there is a discussion which cannot be taken too very long uh, during surgery. So we learn from, from different industries. Um, but by the way, I also think that other industries will learn from healthcare. Absolutely, I agree. And, and, and the double check, right? So I'm oh. thinking about, uh, and healthcare is a nurse, you know, having having another nurse double check and medication administration, let's say, of insulin. Yeah. And, and so those would be things that we have learned from from that in, uh, industry. Uh, another another comment that I just saw come through that I that I absolutely agree with. We have to consider where our patients are in in their journey. And so many of our patients come into the setting, um, and I think of I think of patients just being diagnosed with cancer, scared, right, um, nervous, anxious. Uh, right now, I think of the COVID pandemic. A lot of times, they are not able to bring in visitors with them, so they're alone. Yeah. Um, and and how how do we uh, empower patients that are in that in that mode? Um, patients again, another chat, uh, communication disabilities. I mean. We're thinking our difficulties. We're thinking about all of these factors, and and we can't forget them when we think about patient safety and getting this message across. 
Yeah. Um, I'd like to talk about the reporting of medical errors because I think this is really, really important. Robin, can you tell us about the normal process for reporting medical errors? And who's the most likely person to report a medical error? Okay, well, typically uh, medical error is reported through what we call event management systems or event reporting systems. And they're really a requirement of hospitals and care delivery systems in America and in other national health systems. And now, and it's the responsibility of everyone, anyone who sees something or, or is actually an actor and it could even be a near miss. Um, the idea is that you as leaders create a culture where we wanna hear from you. Please tell us even when you almost made a mistake so we can learn early and mitigate before harm occurs. So uh, a great safe culture would see lots of near miss reporting and see their serious safety events go down at the same time so they have increased detection. But there are other ways to increase detection. You can do proactive monitoring of potential care gaps. Um, you can also use codified triggers based on things like medical billing or other codes in the medical record, such as a code that says return to OR, the patient return to the OR, that could generate a trigger that populates a work list of an identified resource who would then evaluate and make recommendations to do a deeper dive and say, is there something we could learn here and share with the rest of the organization about why this person had to go back to the OR? And then not waiting till something happens in your own institution, but learning from literature and the industry because uh, many of us are publishing our findings and our improvement methodologies to mitigate and eliminate harm. Right, and, and how do we share all of this information? How, how do we, how do, you know, if there's, so much, there's so much information out there, sometimes it's overwhelming. How do we? Yeah, there's, yeah, there's wonderful organizations that we that um, are involved in the safety and quality science um, for instance, there's a huge database uh, where we submit a bunch of data about surgeries, all of our surgeries, and we share that and all that data is aggregated with thousands of other hospitals that are doing surgery. And then we look at our performance trend and benchmark against each other. And so we know who the best performers are. We can reach into them and talk to them and get advice. We do a lot of publication. And so Whenever um, my team is engaging on an improvement project, I always ask them, do the literature review, scan the environment, what's been going on, who's been doing what, and then reach into those that have published so that we don't reinvent the wheel, but we actually take that learning and laterally deploy it across our own organization. Absolutely. Carol, do you have anything to add? I yeah, so Marcy, it's interesting right now because, you know, we've had these PSOs, these patient safety organizations out there for years um, based on ARC, and a lot of them have not been successful. So I can tell you right now, Patient Safety Movement Foundation, Jewish Healthcare are really trying to establish, like the NTSB, the National Trans Transportation Safety Board, a healthcare patient safety board that for finally all the data will come in that we're looking at everyone's data, hopefully at some point, then we can see those smaller nuances, but the patients and families also have access to this and are part of this. Um, we need the same side as type of regulatory body for healthcare, like we have for transportation, if we're gonna ever really make healthcare safer. I, I agree. And, and that's why I think it is so important that, that patients um, or become educated, that they that they start to learn some of the ins and the outs of, of quality and safety so that when this does happen to them, or, you know, God forbid, that they know the actions to take, right? And so um, I, I hear you talking about uh, throughout this conversation, human factors, and I, I think that that is important to consider as well, and, and, and reporting, right? So when a provider um, experiences a near miss, reporting that so that we can learn from it and not make those uh, same mistakes again. I want to talk about uh, the the BIPOC or BIPOC and LGBTQ plus communities. We know that medical errors disproportionately affect these communities. We've talked about this a little bit, and it negatively breaks down communication between the provider and the patient. 
We know that from ARC, the number one reason for medical errors is a breakdown in communication. So doctors take an oath to treat all patients equally, yet we know this isn't always the case. How, how, do, we ensure, how, how do we ensure that the impact on patients isn't greater than it already is? How do we come together um, to help solve this problem? Because it is, it is growing uh, quickly. And, and, and I think about um, the uh, IT, right? And access and, and how, and even reporting mechanisms for patients. Um, are we leaving people behind right now? So I'll take a first step at this, Marcy, and I think there's several things. Is one, um, we're seeing more organizations doing training on cultural diversity, language, pronouns, her, hers, she, all of these things to um, not to further harm patients. You know, if you're transitioning and someone is calling you by the wrong name or the wrong pronoun, those are small microaggressions to those individuals. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we know that on the human factor scale, education is one of those lower level things, but we have to start somewhere. But it has to be multi pronged. So, for instance, research used to be in white men. And then women were allowed to be part of research. And now we realize that we have to look at age. We have to look at different ethnicities. Um, so, you know, that's one part, how we address people. And then the other thing is, is that, you know, we have harmed certain um, groups. If you go back to the Tuskegee Airmen and the way we did research with them in syphilis and Henrietta Locks, there's a trust issue out there with certain different cultures and populations, and rightfully so. So how do we break down those barriers? And I think where it's really showing right now is vaccines. You know, we need to get everyone vaccinated, but we have to have that trust again. Curious, who do, who do patients normally report to? Do, do we know the, the number one person that a, that a patient, when they experience a medical error, who is the who's the first person they're going to share it with? I think family. Family, <laughs> right? Yeah. Family. And then and then what happens? And and then and then what do they do? Well, they're afraid to say anything if they're still in the hospital. Bingo. Right. Because they're afraid that they won't get the kind of care that they should. There's not a great mechanism. Right for patients and families to report, how it often comes out is when they get their press gangy survey or something else where they feel that they can really put everything out there. Um, but, but they, it, it's very difficult in the hospital because you're already in a vulnerable state. Now you've been harmed and you feel even more vulnerable. Right, I, I think about going to a restaurant and you get bad service and you don't wanna complain because you don't want your food to come back, you know, with something in it. And so my, you know, my husband always say, mercy, don't, don't complain. Medical, medical error, that's way worse. You know, you, you have this fear of complaining because what if, what if then they don't treat me well, which of course that never happens. A provider goes in, never intentionally happens. A provider always wants to provide exceptional care for their patients. And I think that we are scared as patients sometimes to ask those important questions. Um, I've been a patient myself numerous times, uh, admitted to the hospital, and I am I am a healthcare professional. I know the questions to ask, and I was scared to speak up for myself. And so I can't imagine how our patients feel. Um, who who should they go to? I saw one. Uh, I saw a comment that uh, they would report a medical error to a PCP, a primary care provider, and I think that's that's excellent. And I would hope that the primary care provider would then file something saying that this happened and we now need to learn from this. Who do you recommend that patients report to? Most uh, hospitals hopefully have a, a patient advocate yeah. and that mm -hmm. would be a great uh, individual to work with. They generally have a risk and quality department and there's always the administration that you can go to. Um, if the organization is responsive, which that would be unfortunate, because I think we know enough about safety science that there should be structures and systems in place to support members through that uh, patients through that process. 
but there are other escalations through regulatory agencies and and unfortunately would hate for them to have to take legal action. Um, that would be a disappointment. I would call that a failure. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities. I, I think there's opportunity to level set early and really embed patient voice um, so that they feel comfortable speaking up. Um, you know, some of the things that have emerged in healthcare in my organization is we actually do um, shift handoff reports at the bedside and include the patient and if appropriate and, and allowed by the patient family members in the discussion. And we glean, again, a lot of information from those content experts. More and more multidisciplinary rounds are conducted in patient wards. And if appropriate, they'll bring the families into those discussions as well. During the admission process, um, if there's a lot of opportunity for the patient and family to be oriented to how they can escalate their concerns and participate in those daily roundings when they are so that they are there and ready to participate during those clinical handoff routines. As you know, during COVID, we created virtual opportunities for families to participate in those discussions. And I think, you know, and another emerging thing are the visual boards in the rooms that include information for the patient, but also from the patient that are helpful, such as including the patient's individual goals, their short and long-term goals. And then I think including the patient and family members in event investigations when safety events happen, so that we understand from their perspective the sequence of events and, and get their insights as to what they think could have been different or enhanced to prevent the event. We've uh, instituted that in our organization and we've made system changes uh, based on uh, input from the, the lens of the patient and their experience in a harm event. Mm -hmm. Inclusion. Yep. I and like I, that word. I'd like to take it even further, Robin, is the patients and families need to share their narrative. It's part mm -hmm. of what they need to do. So that's, that's part of when it comes for the event review. Now, I know a lot of organizations are not doing that. They're not getting the patient, you know, their perspective. And why it's such a big miss is the patient and family are the ones there 24-7. Everybody else is like a revolving door. They see snippets of the movie. They never see the whole picture. And so if we aren't getting it, we're not learning. But then it's closing the loop. So not only do we have it here, and, and I understand that very few organizations literally have the patient and family in the full organization uh, conversation because there's still fear the providers won't feel comfortable or whatever, but we're not closing the loop at the end. We are not going back to those patients and families and saying, here's what we talked about. Here's what we came up with. Do you agree with it? Or what do you think? Or what did we miss? And if we mm -hmm. don't close the loop at the end, we're still missing things because again, they think about a different you filled in per certain pieces, they may be like, oh, no, no, that didn't happen, or that did, and here's what we could have done better. So it's it's not just the upfront, what are we doing here? And then how do you let them, if they want to be part of the process improvement, be part of that? Because for many people, that's a healing opportunity. It's also an opportunity where they know something's been done, um, or they're doing it in honor of a loved one that may have lost their life. So there's there's multiple reasons to let them be involved in that work. It's very humbling for the for the healthcare provider as well. I can speak um, to the institution that I work at, and I, I'm proud to say that we recruit our advisors that sit on our patient family advisory committee from grievances and 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 from resolved grievances. And that's not always an easy conversation. Uh, to, to go into. However, that is the only way we're going to learn. And, and even more so, including them in the root cause analysis, like you said, of what, what exactly went wrong. And I think patients need to know that they can ask to be included, you know, that they can, they can speak up. And, and like you said, Robin, speak out to, uh, reach out to an advocate or an administrator and, and really say that, that I want to be involved in this process. Um, and, and you may get a no, and then you take, you take the next steps, right? Because there are 
resources out there. I saw a comment about ambulatory care, and I'm going to shift the conversation um, because I, I think this is important. We've been talking a lot about inpatient, and we know that the majority of medical errors actually occur in the outpatient setting. Again, uh, often related to diagnostic errors and miscommunication. Why is that? That is that that's where we need that that's the first stop, right? And so if we can stop medical errors hopefully from occurring here, then the patient hopefully never ends up in the hospital. What can we do in the ambulatory setting and specifically the primary care setting? I'm thinking, Robin, about education. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, like you said, those whiteboards, and I think that's great. I think that's fantastic. I, I think about transferring that from inpatient to the outpatient side. I speak about this a lot. A dream of mine would be to walk into any ambulatory clinic and see uh, clinical measures posted for patients and staff to see, right? But it's only useful if we talk about it with our patients. Those whiteboards are only useful if we include our patients in them. I can't tell you how many times I, I see, let's say a patient rights and responsibilities hanging up and it's not visible. It's not somewhere where the patient, it's visible to the patient, but are they really going to be looking there? Maybe not. How important is it to include things like that in the ambulatory setting? The, the One of the nice things like for me, I work in an integrated care delivery system where we we're a health plan, so we provide the insurance and we have the outpatient care delivery as part of our, our company. And then we have the hospitals and we also have some other care. So we're able to um, use our systems and our shared learnings and adapt them to the ambulatory space. And so you're exactly right. It needs equal attention. Our event management system includes uh, the ambulatory space and engagement. And we have we adapt things for that space because uh, the types of injuries or events that happen in the ambulatory space are, are sometimes the same but need modification based on the types of risk. And so um, just being cognizant of how do you adapt it, but it's very feasible to translate all of this and it is done. Um, but I don't, but, but I think in the standalone ambulatory space, is probably not done with the rigor that we would like. I think there's a big, Marcy, there's a big time pressure. Um, you know, physicians have to see so many people are, uh, let's face it, our payment system drives a lot of this and we have a perverse payment system. So we have to sort of fix the payment system. And, and this is more relative to the United States. Um, other countries don't have this because they have a single payer system. But the other thing is, is, you know, we've really just started talking a lot more in the last several years about diagnostic errors. You know, the work that Hardeep Singh and Traber and others are doing in this space is really calling out what are all those biases that play into it? Where's the communication breakdown? Um, I, I think it's probably one of the fastest growing areas that we need to invest money into and keep researching. Um, because we do know, you know, we know technology has not solved all these problems. We thought having electronic medical records and triggers and, you know, all of this, we, we know it because we see it over and over again, misdiagnosis, late diagnosis, no callback, whatever. So, uh, you know, I know a lot of people are looking into it. I know we don't have a perfect solution yet, um, but I think that's the next foray for patient safety. Yeah, I think Here, Peter, Jeff, I don't know, Jeff. Peter can speak to it because um, it, Scandinavia has some of the most advanced safety systems and, uh, and the way they're legal, they're, their med legal is, is designed as well, facilitates a more open and, and comfortable dialogue for the providers. I don't know if Peter has any insights into that. Not, not, not much in Scandinavia. We are close to Scandinavia, but I do not know much about Scandinavia. Um, but I think, yes, there is a difference between the United States situation and, uh, and Europe situation. Absolutely. And within Europe, there are differences between the Eastern and the Western part of, of Europe as well. I think Scandinavia and the Netherlands are more or less the, 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 the same. 
there is a lot of overtreatment because of the payment system in, in, in healthcare in the Netherlands as well. And I'm pretty sure that is also the, the case in Sweden or Denmark. Um, there is a perfect uh, uh, situation uh, in, in that. Yeah. And, and well, listen, I, um, I, 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 oh, listening to the con to, to to this conversation, is there is there is well, a kind of a big elephant in the room about medical errors, and this was the the the, the not diagnosis uh, cause of because of COVID. Um, mm -hmm. I know I do not know the data from from the Netherlands, but I do know the data from the United Kingdom, uh, where um, in 2020. Two million diagnoses have been um, postponed, uh, oh which is uh, which will cause thousands, probably more than ten thousand people dying because of a too late diagnosis. Well, that is kind of a medical error as well. It, absolutely, and the strain uh, placed on on hospitals and and healthcare professionals. Is, is not helping the situation either. I think it's, you know, I think it's important. We have about 15 minutes left and I wanna make sure that we have time for, for Q and A with our audience. We talked about diagnostic errors. What are some other common types of, of medical errors that patients can experience or should be aware of? Well, that, that, that is the, the, what, what, what I call, we do not execute what we already know. I mean, if, 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 if there, there are several ways of treating patients with, for example, lung cancer, um, mm -hmm. and the difference in the Netherlands, we here have a, 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 well, little less than, than 100 hospitals, and it really makes a difference in what hospital you are diagnosed, because the hospital that diagnoses determines the treatment, and not all the treatments are of the same quality but they are given because that treatment is available and that treatment is being reimbursed in that hospital. So, um, and I, I consider that as one of the biggest medical errors um, that, that, that exists. We do not execute what we already know. I agree. And that speaks to what Carol said, you know, with, with, with yeah. diagnostic error, absolutely. And uh, um, absolutely. I think about medication errors. I think about um, wrong site uh, surgeries. Uh, there, there's quite a few, you know, that we could go um, on and on, and it's so important, I think, for for patients to be aware of that. And, and, and to give one example of that, I, I know we I, I work quite a lot with a company called IQVIA, one of the the biggest uh, uh, clinical research organization, and they have data with for, for lung cancer. I know it. Let's say there are two ways of treating, or three ways of treating people patients with with lung cancer: medication A, B, and C. Well, they can see that the result of A is lousy, B, well, it does something, and C is the best, but they see in their data that A and B are still given to patients. This, and then, Unacceptable. Well, and, and this is the data that, 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 that can be analyzed and can be published, but who is the one who dares to publish this data? Right. And then, of course, if it's published, who is the one who dares to take up a stand and say, hey, this is not something that we like to continue? Mm -hmm. Right. I think it's, you know, I think it's up to each and every one of us. And so, so with that, I am going to turn this over to our audience members and see if we have any questions. Let me... And I can move this this. Okay, fantastic. I'm going to open the chat box. Okay. Brody asks, generally, what is the first step that large integrated health systems take to begin including patients on the care team and taking the time to listen to their voice? Who would like to answer this question? Anyone feel free. I think we, we talked about it earlier, I think, um, you know, the first step is probably to establish what is your service culture and your values mm -hmm. uh, and really, you know, establish that and, and have that burning platform. Um, you know, in my organization, we create caring moments because every moment matters. And uh, some of the values include respect and compassion safety is first. And so we can link everything to that and then beginning to think about how do we integrate 
the patient um, into the patient voice into our work. So, uh, like like my organization and many others, we have bedside shift handoff, and I talked about multidisciplinary rounding um, during the admission process, really orienting the patients to where they can elevate their voice, including signage that gives them the information so they don't have to remember um, to how they can elevate or escalate or, um, or have the discussion. I think sometimes it helps even to have some scripting for creators that helps them uh, get out of their kind of checklist mode and then give them that, that scripted guidance so that they remember to ask the questions or ask that patient's opinion. And then, um, you know, just in every way, we try to look where we can include, including what we call human-centered design. Um, when we start an improvement process, we get, when we're designing, we include all the stakeholders, whether it be a, a clinic doctor or the hospital and the nurses and then the patients. And then when we look at equity, did we design for those disparities? And that's a maturity we're getting to now. Do, did we look for disparities in our baseline data that said, hey, we've got a problem here. And as we're designing, we're actually designing uh, to, to bridge the gap between uh, where we have equitable um, disparities. So uh, those are some thoughts. I don't know if Carol has anything to add. Well, I think you have to have leadership first that's going to support it. Um, leadership, risk management, legal, because I can tell you the battles, you know, you can have people at the front lines that want to do it, but if you're still butting heads because it's a de deny and defend or they don't want the patient voice. So there really has to be a culture that says we want to engage our patients. We want to learn with them, from them, all of those different things. Um, I think the other thing is, is that you're seeing more and more patient advocates that we feel like we've softened our voices because it was our way to get in the door, you know, and I think there's enough patients out there through PFACs and things that really now we don't have to soften our voices anymore. Mm -hmm. We really, there's enough of us now that we can speak up and I can see, um, I'm going to let you say something, Stephen, because I can see you you believe in that. Like, I feel like we've got that tipping point. Yep, absolutely. I, I saw, so in the chat, there is the, there's a remark about the patient bill of rights should yes. be posted as well. Our organization, Inspire to Live, in 2014, 2015, we built together with uh, a dozen of other organizations, patient advocacy organizations, the, the Cancer Patients Bill of Rights, and we, we, we handed it over to the European Parliament. Uh, and, and well, that was really a statement that we could make. Okay. And of course, that's a long-term trajectory to, uh, to, to, to bring it into practice. But shortly after that, we, we together with the, the organization that I mentioned, Mentioned before, we, uh, we we made a statement that that how to implement the cancer patient bill of rights, what to do, and every time knock on that door of the, your your own parliament, the European Parliament, wh wherever you are, and, and 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 what Carol says, I think really a good example of how patient advocacy can be very effective is uh, the ACT UP movement for the HIV AIDS patients in the 90s of the former century. They were very successful. They knew what they were talking about. That's very important that you know what you're talking about. So you mm -hmm. have to know th uh, 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 things about, uh, well, in my, my, my expertise, you have to know about molecular biology, you have to know about healthcare, you have to know about treatments, how to design drugs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if you know what you're talking about, you have to be very activistic because otherwise they won't listen to you. Absolutely. And I think that um, it, it, the, the, what you said about, I, there was a comment about PFACs and, um, you know, I think that most organizations are starting to come along with PFACs, right? And the, and the really meaningful work that our advisors can do. Um, I would even take it a step further with the patient bill of rights or patient rights and responsibilities. 
and say uh, something that that, that um, uh, UNMH did was our, our patients actually wrote the patient rights and responsibilities, our PFAC. And so there's some ownership in that. Um, it's not, it's, it's nothing about me, right, without me. And that is really, really defining that. So um, absolutely. Uh, let me see if there's any further questions. And I am actually going to try to stop sharing my screen here from a minute. Oh, absolutely. Okay. It looks like, yeah, no problem. I got the message. Okay. So here's another question. Um, let's see, how do we stay away from always being concerned with the revenue in healthcare? Great question. And going back to caring for human life. Great question. <laughs> Loaded question, but a great question. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't. <laughs> please, please go on. Yeah, you know, it is a difficult question. It assumes that um, that everyone in healthcare is really looking at dollars. I actually think that most people come to work every day to do the right thing. They went into healthcare for a reason, and it's rare. Um, the person that is solely in it for some sort of revenue producing, um, you know, there is a need to be solvent, right? So we can keep our care delivery system open in our community. So we have to be excellent stewards of um, the finances uh, and that we um, that we manage. Um, I think that there's probably some models that are better than others. Um, you know, for me, coming to Kaiser was unique because um, our our system is designed that we carry the risk and uh, we actually don't make money when our people are sick, so or when they have surgery, and so we um, our whole world is focused on optimizing health, and there's no pressure for our institutions to try to have more market share of the total hips and knees and those kinds of things. So this is a new culture for me. However, more and more, for instance, the American College of Surgeons, in fact, one of my hospitals yesterday was spurred one of the first hospitals validated for their um, geriatric um, care program. And they provide awesome. criteria and guidance to partner with the patient um, in decision making through really clear transparency around all the risk and options for surgery. We've adopted this um, in our organization um, because we found that when we are really transparent with our patients, that uh, in some cases, 60% opt not to go to surgery and try other therapeutics. So there's not a rush to that, um, that, that surgical experience. So I think that there's, you know, growing uh, work in this. And I think that Peter spoke to what does the patient want and how much care do they want and how willing are we to hear their voice and partner with them in those hard decisions so they get the amount of care and the level of care and intervention that they want based on their personal goals and needs. So it's evolving, but I think the hearts are in the right place. I, I can't say it's perfect. I also think about uh, nursing care models that, that organizations can adopt, um, such as like compassionate connected care, or even um, candor, right? Using candor when communicating with patients or encouraging patients to share their lived experience has a, a document where patients, you know, are prepared and they, they answer these five questions prior to going to their appointments. And so I think those are all useful tools as well to think about the human side of, of medical error. So fantastic. I'm gonna see if we have time and also, you know, aligning incentives, right? We have to encourage health organizations to start aligning their incentive, incentives. It, it has to happen. Um, it, it, and, it's, and I agree, Carol, now we have a voice. And, and I think PFACs have a stronger voice too. And we'll have a much stronger voice when we all come together, providers and patients, uh, and cultivate collaboration. So this was very enjoyable. I, I thank you all for a robust conversation. And I thank the audience for being so engaged uh, and thank you, Patient Safety Movement Foundation, for this opportunity. I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. I see you're back on, and if you need me to end this, let me know and I can do so. 
Perfect. Well, I just wanted to close this out and say thank you again, Marcy, for moderating. Thank you to all of our panelists for such a great conversation. Um, for those of you that joined a little bit late, I just wanted to provide a few more housekeeping items. Just a simple reminder that if you are joining the live webinar, we do have um, one CE credit for BCPA credit. So again, it will take about five to seven days to process. If you have any questions at all, feel free to email clinical at patientsafetymovement.org. And then finally, if you enjoy this webinar and you want to continue hearing all of the great webinars and educational content that we have to offer, just keep in mind that we do provide this free of charge. Um, so obviously as a nonprofit, we do rely heavily on donations from individuals like yourself. So we really wanna just ask you to consider helping us continue to keep these going and donate on our website at donate at patientsafetymovement.org. But again, thank you so much. Thank you to all of our panelists. If you guys have any questions at all, feel free to email us, but we encourage you to just continue doing all the great work that you're doing and keep up the great work. Thank you.